Hello ladies and gentlemen welcome to Triple N Media I am Dr Nick Nickam and this is cardiology lecture series and all our programs are video stream through YouTube and please please do subscribe to our YouTube channel now the feature presentation Hello ladies and gentlemen I am Dr Nick Nickam and welcome to Triple N Media ACLS uh, lecture series today we are going to talk about uh, bradycardia algorithm let's look at some of the objectives that we are going to be addressing in this presentation first we are going to identify the underlying rhythm namely bradycardia we have to determine if the symptoms the patient is having are related to the slow heart rate the next step is to select the appropriate treatment option if the first option fails we can try a second or a third option we are going to look at what are the conditions where we might consider transcutaneous pacing and most importantly whatever intervention we do we have to make sure that there is an improvement in patient's overall condition and some of the symptoms caused by this hypotension are corrected we'll also learn when to call for an expert opinion when everything else fails to improve the patient's overall condition so let's continue what is bradycardia by definition bradycardia is a heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute but in reality being a cardiologist i have seen many cardiac patients who are walking talking and laughing who have heart rates in the range of 40 to 50 some of it is physiological and some of it may be related to the drug interactions such as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers or even clonidine and some athletes may have real slow heart rates in the 40s and 50s and they are perfectly fine playing basketball on the field but we are talking about uh, a heart rate of less than 60 in, in an unstable patient who is having symptoms or the slow heart rate is due to pathological changes in the heart electrical system or the cardiovascular system in general involving the autonomic nervous systems and most importantly when we are evaluating cardiac bradyarrhythmias the most important thing is is the patient symptomatic and are the symptoms related to the slow heart rate if that is a case then we're going to proceed with the bradycardia algorithm let's look at some examples of slow heart rate not every heart rate that is below 60 is alike there are many conditions that can give rise to a slower heart rate and most of them relate to the block at the av junction you are familiar with the first degree av block where there is prolongation of the pr interval to greater than 200 milliseconds and that doesn't pose any major problem then we have the second degree av block under which we have two categories namely the wenke block where there is progressive prolongation of the pr interval followed by a drop in the p wave this is known as the wenke block and here is an example of a type 2 av block where there is the pr intervals are constant but there is a p wave dropped after each qrs complex but nonetheless a slower heart rate associated with cardiovascular symptoms which we are going to talk about in a minute needs attention here is an example of a complete heart block why do i say this is complete heart block because the atria are beating at their own rate as you can see and the ventricles are beating at their own rate the ventricular rate is considerably smaller there is no relationship between the p waves and the qrs complexes so there is complete dissociation of the atrial 
and ventricular activities. So this is a case of a complete heart block. It is unlikely to respond to atropine because the atropine increases conduction through the AB node and since the AB node is uh, deceased, it is not going to respond as well as you would in a patient with a sinus bradycardia. So in this situation, an immediate transcutaneous pacemaker or a transvenous pacemaker may be the most appropriate choice. We can try epinephrine and dopamine to get the heart rate or at least maintain the blood pressure until we can implement transcutaneous or transvenous pacing. Here is an example of an idioventricular rhythm in a patient with an acute inferior myocardial infarction. So when you see this type of a rhythm problem, we can try some medications, but uh, more than likely these patients may end up needing pacing, either transcutaneous or intravenous pacing. So these are some of the examples where a treatment may be required provided these patients are symptomatic. What kind of symptoms are we talking about? Slow heart rate associated with low blood pressure, mental confusion, poor perfusion, shortness of breath with pulmonary congestion, weakness, dizziness, syncope, fatigue. When these symptoms are associated with a slower heart rate, then trying to improve the heart rate might help to reverse some of these changes that we see that are related to the slow heart rate. Okay, let's talk about symptomatic bradycardia, some general considerations. When you are standing beside a patient in an intensive care unit whose heart rate is say for example 42 per minute and has all those symptoms that we talked about in the previous uh, slide then we need to immediately start cardiac monitoring make sure the patient has adequate airway make sure the the pulse oximeter is in place peripheral oxygenation level and of course you need to have a good blood pressure monitoring apparatus to monitor the changes with the treatment and IV access is important to administer medications and of course you provide oxygen to improve overall oxygenation. Okay let's talk about what are the medical and pacing options available for patients with bradycardia or bradyarrhythmia. The most commonly used medication is of course atropine which is 0.5 milligrams given intravenously as a bolus. This can be repeated every three to five minutes up to a maximum of uh, three milligrams. After that you won't be able to use any more atropine. If the patient is hypotensive, please remember atropine does not address the question of hypotension. So if the patient is hypotensive, along with atropine, we can start these patients on epinephrine IV infusion with a dose ranging from 2 to 10 micrograms per minute. Or we can also use dopamine at a rate of uh, 2 to 20 micrograms per kg per minute. And if these things don't work, of course, we can consider transcutaneous pacing, which I will talk about in a minute. When all these things fail, we should know when to get expert opinion. It is very important to make sure that we have the knowledge to call for the expert opinion when necessary. Okay, let's talk about uh, some of the side effects of the drugs that we just covered. Atropine, can cause uncontrolled increase in heart rate. But generally, the heart rate comes down over a period of several minutes. Epinephrine not only increases the heart rate, it can also cause blood pressure, increase in blood pressure. It increases myocardial ischemia, and it also causes peripheral vasoconstriction, which may be a disadvantage in a patient with an acute coronary syndrome. Similarly, dopamine also increases heart rate, blood pressure, it also increases myocardial ischemia and causes peripheral vasoconstriction. Hence, before we start these patients on epinephrine or dopamine, we should make sure we correct the hypovolemia in these patients uh, so that we can get the maximum benefit from the volume expansion and also from the inotropic and chronotropic effects of epinephrine and dopamine. Okay, let's talk about transcutaneous pacing. Basically, a transcutaneous pacemaker, which is nowadays a part of a, a full-fledged defibrillator, 
except you have to turn the button to pacing, it sends electrical current just like during defibrillation through the skin which is passed through the heart which stimulates the pacemaker cells in the heart and thus stimulating the ventricle basically to produce a ventricular rhythm such as the one we are seeing here. Since it is sending electrical current in a conscious patient, it is fairly uncomfortable and these electrical shocks are easily felt by the patients. The ventricle may or may not capture the electrical impulse depending upon how strong the impulse is reaching the ventricle in a given patient. If the patient is extremely obese, has a thick chest wall or a thick skin and the impedance to the electrical conduction is high, then chances are the transcutaneous pacemaker may not be able to capture the ventricle. Most important thing is, can it improve the heart rate? Can it excite the ventricle? Can it improve the blood pressure, oxygen level, peripheral perfusion? And most important, and we also need to address patient discomfort. And remember, this transcutaneous pacing is sort of flickery. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes it may not produce the desired hemodynamic responses. So it is always important to remember that transcutaneous pacing is a temporary solution and a more permanent solution needs to be implemented as soon as the patient's overall condition becomes stable. Here are some of the things that we need to consider when we are using a transcutaneous uh, uh, pacemaker. We place the paddles, one in front, and one behind so that we can get the maximum electrical impulse traveling through the myocardial tissue. Then we connect the paddles to the defibrillator machine. We set the machine to pacing mode. Set the rate at 70 to 80 per minute. This, sorry, this should be 70. And most importantly, sedate the patient. Initiate the pacing. Then gradually increase the energy level delivered by the machine until we see good ventricular capture as we are seeing in this uh, tracing here. And set the energy level approximately 10 milliamps above the level needed to get good ventricular capture. If you go beyond 130 milliamps, then we can replace, we can reposition the electrodes and see if we can get a better response. If that doesn't work, then transvenous pacemaker may be indicated because beyond 130 milliamps, the patient is going to be extremely uncomfortable with the electrical energy going through his body every beat. No matter whether we try medications, transcutaneous pacemaker or even a transvenous pacemaker, the most important objective is to see that we improve the patient's overall cardiovascular condition until we have time to understand what caused these unstable cardiovascular conditions and address that underlying pathophysiology. So the question is, did the medication or the pacemaker improve the heart rate, which in most cases we would expect it to be yes. Did the lower blood pressure improve? That is questionable. If it improves, that's very good. Did the patient uh, mental confusion get better? Do you see a better tissue perfusion? Is the patient's shortness of breath less? Is the patient feeling better? Are there side effects are there side effects from the drug the patient is not able to tolerate? And once we have addressed all these uh, issues, the next step is we have to identify what caused the bradycardia to start with. If this is an acute inferior myocardial infarction with uh, bradycardia, which can sometimes last several days, treating these patients with coronary intervention and improving the circulation by placement of a stent uh, may be an appropriate step to help salvage the myocardium and stabilize the patient's hemodynamics. So it is always important to understand the underlying pathophysiology and address them as soon as the patient's overall condition becomes stable. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of bradycardia algorithm. I hope you have been able to learn something about bradycardia, what are the causes of bradycardia, what are the various types of bradycardia, 
how do they present and how do we use medications to improve bradycardia related symptoms and how a transcutaneous pacemaker may play a role and when we need to get expert consultation when things don't work out the way we plan thank you so much for watching i am dr nick nickam thank you so much for watching our program and please do subscribe to our youtube channel if you would like to support this program you can look for the dollar sign on the right hand side of your browser and support in any way you possibly can again thank you so much for watching this presentation and until next time i am dr nick nickam